about the flowers I left at your door When I close my eyes I still hear that truck I still feel my heart beat As I ran through that park Do it in the park. <laughs> it's really worth it to take it class. You will, you will learn. And at the same time, you will love it. <laughs> I'm trying to make literary novels. I'm trying to make work that will last longer than the next boating season. And that will be around after I'm long gone. Um, there's no guarantee of that, and no writer knows if that's going to be true of his work or not, and the odds are overwhelming that when I die, my work will disappear with me. But I'm still trying to make work that will be around after I'm gone. But Bob has this really gifted way of capturing character and the essence of the people that he's creating in his work. Myself placing all these other authors and writers and characters in the landscape that Bob creates with his words. I want the readers to laugh, I want them to cry, I want them to be scared, I want them to be drawn in and unable to put the book down. All of those things. Every literary writer wants to entertain as well. But I, I wouldn't say that I've written one comedy. It was called Almighty Me. So what was the idea behind the Almighty Me? Yeah, it, it became Bruce Almighty. Um, they, the premise was it's a man who is given God's power for a year. He can do anything he wants with it. God goes on vacation. And he's given God's power for a year, and he's told not to mess it up. And uh, he, you know, basically <laughs> messes it up. He's trying to get his, girl, his wife, actually, to um, give up this idea of going to college and just spend time at home with him. And he's really not a very great guy and he doesn't understand why he's been given this power. Later in the book you find out, I guess this is a kind of spoiler alert, the reason God has chosen him to give him his power is because love doesn't run very deep in him. He doesn't really know how to love another. He thinks only of himself and God doesn't want to give his power to someone who knows about love or how to love because love is not God's idea, it's a man's idea. At one point in the book, he discovers from um, God's emissary that God is law. Human beings invented love, not God. And all of these books are Bob Bausch's. This one right here is one that he is very famous for, Almighty Me. As a matter of fact, I sold Almighty Me to Disney for a huge amount of money, but they were supposed to pay me that same amount of money when the film was released. But Disney didn't release it. They let Universal and Spyglass release it, and they didn't pay me what they owed me. They didn't even credit me on the film. When the film came out, my name wasn't on it. I googled it again, and I saw another person there. They said the studio was written by him. Yeah, the script. Yeah, the, the two script writers, uh, I, think, I can't remember his name. I have a copy of the script. Um, they came out of the Disney script mill. Uh, that's where my book went. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, they, somebody had to write the script, and whoever wrote the script used my book to do it. How did I know what? When did you bring it? Uh, last night I oh, left it there. Mm -hmm. okay. His newest novel is called As Far As The Eye Can See, um, set in the West, um, during the time, I believe, um, uh, after the Civil War and um, around the Bozeman Trail area. Um, so I'm currently reading that book right now. I'm real proud of the one that I just published called Far As The Eye Can See because it takes place out west and takes place in the 1870s and I've never been in either place out west or in the 1870s and I just made it up. A movie? <laughs> Not just for it. Well, I can tell you all of the books but I don't know if I can pick which one is my favorite there. It's, it's sort of like trying to decide which child is your favorite child. You know, I like them all. Um, I don't know if I could pick one. I guess I can say the ones I'm most proud of um, for its um, experimental <clears throat> nature. I'm proud of The Gypsy Man because it's a story told by 
13 different narrators in 66 chapters. Um, and I guess I'm real proud of a book I wrote called A Hole in the Earth, mainly because when I finished it, I hated the book. I kicked it out of the house like a bad teenager. I hated it. But um, everybody loved it. And when I was going through rereading it for the publisher, you know, to proofread it and everything, I saw that I really had written a pretty good book. It wasn't a, something I should hate at all. I just hated it because I worked so hard on it for so long. Um, but Indigo. in order of their publication, I wrote a book called On the Way Home. Then I wrote a book called The Lives of Riley Chance. And then I wrote a collection of stories called The White Rooster and Other Stories. And then I wrote a book called Almighty Me. And then I wrote a book called A Hole in the Earth. And then came The Gypsy Man. And then came a book called Out of Season. And then came Far as the Eye Can See. And then this coming fall, I have a book coming out called The Legend of Jesse Smoke. And then in the spring, the following year, I have a book coming out called In the Fall They Come Back. Have you ever did something wrong in your life that you regretted? Um... It's kind of hard to think of anything I regret. Um, I, th I think the only thing, I, I'm not saying I've, I've led a perfect life or anything, but you always learn things from what you do. I, I guess the one thing I regret more than anything else, I think of it now still, is when I came home from the military, I expected my parents to be kind of disapproving because they asked us to leave. And so I was, um, I put off coming home. I kept saying, yeah, I'm coming this Friday. Then I'd call and say, no, I'm, I'm not coming yet. I was still in Illinois. And finally I did come home. And when I pulled up in front of my house, um, I was walking up the driveway. And my father, who was, I knew he loved me, but he was never very demonstrative, ever. Um, he came running outside and came up to me, and I sort of backed away and hugged me really hard, put his, wrapped his arms around me and hugged me. And I was so shocked. I just stood there with my hands to my side. And before I could reach up and hug him back, he realized how embarrassed I was and then stepped back away from me and looked at the ground and sort of... And I know he was embarrassed, and I, to this day, I... I really regret that I didn't hug him back right away, that I didn't wrap my arms around him and hold, and hold him. It still bothers me. I just, and you can't get that back. If I'd have reached out for him and tried to hug him, it would have even made it worse, I think. But that's the kind of thing I regret, things like that. Um, and jobs, yeah, I've had a lot of jobs. I quit or got fired from... Actually, I got fired from every job I ever had except this one right here, teaching. You will get A. No, because I'm not a good writer. Well, not because I didn't write, but because it's me, not you. Women attempted more, but they don't go through on there. There are, I don't, I don't know if those, that's, I, I do know, the one statistic I know about suicide in women is that they almost never shoot themselves in the head. Men do. Hapsy, George, Lydia, Jimmy. Uh, I wouldn't give up teaching no matter how much money I made writing. I love teaching. I, lo I love, I, I can't think of anything more rewarding um, than working with young people and seeing them come into their own for what they want, to find their own dream. Hello, Professor. How are you? This is my mentor, the great Bob. You, learned, you didn't know a thing when you met me, did you? Nope. Not a, not a clue. <laughs> Head was empty, completely oh, empty. All it had were like I filled funny it stories. Yeah. So Bob um, works in the same office with me, um, and he's come in to speak in my classes, and he's sort of a mentor and an inspiration to me. Are you going to film some of my students, too? <laughs> <laughs> Good. They're also photogenic. Don't leave Taylor out. <laughs> Take about, about a 10 minute, 15 minute break, no more. Um, I hated school when I was in school. I hated it. 
I mean, if somebody had told me when I graduated from high school that I would spend the balance of my life on one side of the desk or the other in a school, I would have gone to a hardware store and bought a knife and killed myself. But when I was in the military, they made me a teacher of survival. And I thought it was worth doing because what's more important to teach somebody who, whose plane gets shot down than how to survive in the jungle or in the woods or in the ocean or whatever. So I taught survival for four years and when I came back I wanted to go to college because I wanted to get into politics. I, I thought I wanted to um, you know, be president. <laughs> I wanted to get into politics so I studied law and then I studied um, uh, history and economics and it took me seven years before I I got a BA but I got a BA in English just by accident I was um, well working with Bob is an extraordinary joy because he has over 30 years of experience teaching and he's a very gifted storyteller everything he does is a story and also a lesson and so I find myself learning from him every day, every conversation. He's also incredibly generous with his time. I have also interviewed Bob Bausch, and so I spent two hours talking with him and taking notes, and he was just so, so willing to talk about anything that was on my mind. He's guest lectured in my classes as well, and he, as, as a writer myself, I know that we just don't have that much time, but he is always willing to say yes to everything, so he He's very giving with his students and my students. He stops by my classes and other classes. And he also visits the Woodbridge campus and does readings. Uh, I think uh, this semester, last semester, the semester before, he's always giving readings. It flickered and winked like an eye. Quietly, it fluttered and dwindled. Granny laid curled down within herself, amazed and watchful, staring at the point of light that was herself. Her body was now only a deeper mass of shadow in an endless darkness and this darkness would curl around the light and swallow it up. God, give a sign. For a second time, there was no sign. How you doing? What the hell game is this? Uh, it's Magic the Gathering. It's, uh, it's, like a, it's a battle card game. Uh, can you tell us about your early life? When I was in high school, my report card read like a guy who stutters trying to say foul ball. Okay, I flunked everything. I don't even know what Providence caused me to graduate from high school. I'm, um, they called me and my twin brother Richard in and asked us, uh, told us we were not going to graduate. But since we had already rented the gown and already invited family, they were going to let us walk across the stage at graduation. They were going to give us a blank paper wrapped up with the ribbon. And um, then we'd have to go to summer school. I had to take history and English. Dick had to take English and math, okay, or we weren't going to graduate. And um, we walked out of that office, and my brother said, well, what are we going to do? I said, we're not going to do anything. They're going to give us a blank sheet of paper. Mom and Dad will never know. And he said, well, won't they look at the paper? I said, no, they didn't look at Barbara. My sister Barbara graduated two years before. They didn't look at her diploma. We're going to throw it up in the air. And um, we'll just say we threw our diploma up with our hat and never went and got it. I'm not going to summer school. And who's going to ask us if we graduated from high school? My answer to that question is always going to be yes, to hell with them. Um, well, so when graduation came, my whole family's there. I walk up. I'm going across the stage. They give me this piece of paper. I'm going off over to the other side, thinking about where I'm going to stash it because so my parents don't want to look at it. And I feel raised lettering on it. You know, that's what that. With that. So I took the ribbon off, and it was a diploma. I almost, I made a chirp like a bird. I went, Whoa! <laughs> so I, I um, immediately thought, I can't wait to show this to my brother, and then I'm going to tell mom and dad that Dick's diploma is not real. He's got to go to, he's got to go to summer school. Well, it turned out they did the same thing to him. He, it, that's what made me think it's not a mistake. They just decided they were done with us. They wanted us out of there. My teachers convinced me through high school that. I didn't have anything to say. So by the time I got out of high school, I wasn't writing anything. I was just hanging around shooting pool, still reading a lot. I loved reading always. But um, I just, you know, just hanging around. And then I got, when I was in high school, I got in all kinds of trouble anyway. I was, 
um, we were stealing cars, we were breaking and entering. Um, I got arrested for breaking and entering. Um, and we weren't stealing anything. We were going to watch a color TV. We knew somebody in the neighborhood who had a color TV. We knew he was in school. We broke into his house and watched color TV. Had a ball, matter of fact. We laughed. We made everybody on the screen green. Then we made them all blue. It was funny. Um, but we got in all kinds of trouble for it. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know how it... I think it, the Vietnam War came along and we were drafted into the Army. And my father was infantry in World War II. He was a war hero. He was decorated. And he told us, you don't want to be in the infantry. Who should I talk to? <laughs> Maddie wants to be in the movie, so that makes me want to talk to Maddie. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm kind of having fun talking to you. This is kind of delightful. <laughs> My cupcake, and you didn't want this it? Is, was this you? Yeah. Okay, I don't eat anything unless I know who it's from. <laughs> He's just an incredibly generous and thoughtful and well-read man. He's read an incredible amount of books across different genres and times and spaces. And he has this incredible, tremendous wealth of information and ideas to draw on, which I think is what makes him such a gifted professor and a truly inspirational scholar. Uh, do you have any message to your students, to your readers, to the, those who want to write, who want to become writers? Yeah. The the, the main thing you have, if you want to be a writer, you have to read, and you have to read voraciously. Um, I got 4,000 books, and I've read most of them, and I'm, I'm reading uh, you know, two, three, four hours a day. Every day I read. You have to read. The more you read, the more you'll learn how to put the language in print, the more you'll recognize it. You also have to keep writing. Uh, the silence is big. You spend any time in its mouth and it'll swallow you whole and you'll not write anymore. I know lots of really fine writers who aren't writers anymore because they just don't do it. They might go around saying they're writers, but they're not doing it. You're a writer as long as you're writing. As soon as you stop writing, you're no longer a writer. It's not like, you know, if you commit a murder, you're a murderer for the rest of your life. If you commit a short story, you're a writer only as long as you're working on that story or committing another one. If you're not committing another story, you're no longer a writer. And also, um, um, make sure you read more than one book at a time. You should be reading three or four books all at once, all the time, so that when you write, you're yourself. You're not sounding like the book you happen to be reading at whatever moment. Human beings are profoundly imitative. If you're reading a particular writer, you'll sound like that writer when you write, unless you read four or five other writers then you'll sound like yourself. You won't sound like the one writer you're reading. <laughs> the flowers I left at your door When I close my eyes I still hear that